Okay. So uh, what's the date today? April 19th? Yeah. But that matters. It's going to be on YouTube anyway. But uh, this is what she said, what they said. What is it? What the, I don't even remember the subtitle of her own show. Scott, Phil, or Stephen, Phil, and Scott, or Phil, Stephen, Scott, stay at home and watch the movies. Or stay, stay inside and watch the movies. Stay at home and watch movies. Right. So it's our COVID special. So uh, we try and get together every month or so. We pick a couple movies. This two, we've picked two, which are pretty disparate. I think it's safe to say. The Sound of Metal, or Sound of Metal, I think it might just be called. And uh, Town Bloody Hall, a documentary. So let's do a Sound of Metal. Um, I'm a little disappointed in what happened for myself. I did uh, watch it through the... TIFF site, which is Toronto International Film Festival, mm -hmm. and great quality and everything. But for some reason, I was under the impression that I had it for a bit longer because before these discussions, I, I like obviously to see the film and then I like to sort of flip through it a little bit, you know, just to get that sort of second peek at it. But for some reason, when I went to it today and I thought I was within the 48 hour time frame. It's 24, Scott. Ah, okay, well, that explains it then. I think I'm yeah. used to on, I think it's, oh, when you rent a movie from YouTube, you get a 48 hour time frame. So that would explain. So anyway, yeah. I saw it once. I didn't take any notes, but I've watched the trailer since. And I've read, you know, I do look at a couple of reviews here and there. Um, so I think Stephen sort of had initially, you watched this movie before we did and you actually suggested, I thought it was a good suggestion. So I don't know, you want to start Stephen, just maybe give even a little synopsis of what it's about. I'll just say, I actually thought I might be heading into a documentary. I, I knew so little about it before I watched it. I thought I was going to be watching a documentary. And I was pleasantly surprised that it wasn't a documentary. Um, anyway, that's all I'll say to start things off. So, In that line, I'd say I know that some of the, the actors were not actors. And that sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. The one guy, he's nominated for Best Supporting Actor. So in his case, it, it worked. Um, uh, he's uh, just he I did read up on him. He is an actor. Um, oh, he's got okay. six or seven credits now, but he also he's sort of half and half in that his parents or at least one of his parents uh, was deaf. Yeah. So but he does have an acting a little bit of an acting resume. Actually, I'll just clarify that because I just read really recently. I think his father was born deaf and his mother went deaf at the age of six or something. So mm. They must but have you're, met for that reason or something. So. Yeah, but Stephen's right in that I think a lot of the people in that home were non-actors. And without without it being noticeable, um, that's that's really the moment point as far as that goes. <clears throat> when I saw the movie, the first well, the only uh, and I, I, my first sentence I wrote it was, okay, I don't know what they call best sound in the Oscars, anymore, but this movie's going to win, or there's it's a joke because the way it uses sound, not in a showy way. Nothing about the movie for me was showy. It, it used things to get its story and characters across. So what we experienced the, uh, the, the world of, I'm gonna say Riz on it, forget his character's name, but we experienced it by the, by the sound that was in the picture. And it was, I thought it was very effective and very smart how they how they did it. Um, now, just a day or two ago, I didn't actually notice which awards it was, but there were some awards given a couple of days ago, and something else beat it for sound. So apparently, I'm not uh, the expert on this. It's already won the award for sound. Uh, it was not the Oscars. It was for something else. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it is award. nominated for the yeah. Award. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's like voting for. Chad Bosman, it was like, yeah, this guy, this movie, it was brilliant for that. It wasn't the only re reason I thought it was wonderful, but that really made a big difference, the way they use sound. But and it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, it draws attention to itself because it's different from other things we've seen, but it doesn't really draw attention to itself. It just sucks us into that world. And so I, I think that's, you know, clearly they thought about it in advance. They, they pulled it off. I was very impressed with that angle. Then, of course, you've got the, the great acting uh, by Riz Ahmed. Uh, I don't know if you guys looked at all the stuff he did to prepare for the role because he didn't, he didn't do any of that. He didn't know American Sign Language. He didn't know how to play the drums. He didn't know most of that stuff, and so he learned it. 
for the movie. And I'm, you know, that's to me, that's better than like putting on 30 pounds or, you know, or whatever. Just to be able to learn that kind of stuff. Uh, be, not so that he could show off that he knew sign language, but so he could be his character. You know, and hesitant at first with it because, uh, actually, I thought I thought he learned sign language kind of quickly. Uh, I don't know what the time frame for the movie was, but it was like, there's a scene where he yeah would do it, and the next scene he's starting to get into it, and the next scene he's like, oh, he's, he's yeah. getting away. Uh, whatever. There were a couple uh, of plot. There were a couple of plot points that I thought kind of were a little questionable as as choices. But go go ahead, Phil. That I was just want to say them. I think I think William Hurt learned sign language for Children of a Lesser God, didn't yeah. he? Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't. You know, I didn't like it as much as that. I I was thinking it belongs to this. There's certain movies where it goes along, and I'm thinking, well, this is okay, but I'm not really sure why they did it it sounds crazy i know um and then i love the ending i was thinking of other films where i'm sort of eh, okay and then i love the ending and the one i thought of was uh man of course well one would be the tarkovsky film stalker which i sit there and i'm just fidgeting all the way through it and then it's got this famous amazing shot at the end and then the director i forget his name but they call him archie he's got the long long name last name that begins with w he does like centuries and syndromes i'm sure you know who i'm talking oh, about. oh joe joe yeah he's i said the guy who says joe. call me joe joe and, and i do that's he's made a couple of films where i love the ending and then got very little out of the rest of the film that's not true of this film i think it had good things about it and i was very like scott first of all i knew absolutely the only thing i knew the single only thing i knew about it was that it wasn't about heavy metal I somehow gleaned that. I didn't know it was a documentary. I think in my mind, I thought it was going to be kind of a, a strange film with sort of avant-garde sound and something about the, like a philosophical meditation on sound, which it was in a way. Um, but I also think it's kind of a conventional, you know, Hollywood problem film in a, in a way. And, and it is nominated for Academy Awards. And you know, you mentioned, well, you had to learn sign language and, and that. Um, and I think, you know, it was good. It was well done, but I didn't, I didn't think it was outstanding. Um, I, uh, you know, I went along. It's, I, I, I think it's making, it's interesting the point it's making where he decides to take it off at the end, the hearing aids. And it, I immediately thought back to um, the guy in charge of the house and he said those moments of stillness uh, that was what made it so good oh, and I wanted to say that I, I think I was sort of an ideal person to um, really engage with this film because I definitely have hearing issues I could see where one day I hate to say it you know my hearing gets worse I spent the last two years in the classroom constantly asking kids what you got to speak up you got to speak up and the other thing I do battle with and it's getting worse all the time is tinnitus where two years ago I used to get it occasionally it's about half the time now and it's weird I get it for two or three days in a row and then it goes away for two or three mm -hmm. days in a row now the last couple days it's not been good not not bad you know there's one recorded per uh, one recorded instance of somebody had it so bad he actually committed suicide um, I don't get it that bad but you know I'm aware of it and it, it's really can it's not good and you get this cycle where i think it's i've read it's partly caused by stress but then when you get it you get stressed out and it, you know it's like a feedback loop so i i did sort of empathize with that part of the film but i don't know i just didn't find anything truly outstanding about it i liked it but you know other than the ending i think it's a film i will probably forget fairly quickly and I don't know if I'll watch it again. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to make this my my singular point, but there were a couple. Um, there just seemed a couple of motivations or plot points that I did have some issue with. Like that, to me, the strangest one. But please correct me if I just viewed it wrong or you guys took it differently. But I just found it so weird and almost to the point where it's like ah, that just doesn't seem right. Like when the main the main character, you said what his name was in the movie. Ruben, Ruben. Ruben, right, right. When Ruben um, 
you know, does the thing where he sells off the RV so he can get the implants or whatever. And then it just seems so weird. Like he goes back to the house and, you know, and that's kind of a sad moment. He wants to get back in and all that. Yeah. But it just seems strange. Like how would the the guy, the dean of the house, Paul Racy, whatever his character was in the movie, how would he not sort of, like it was almost like this came as a surprise to him that he sold the RV and sold the equipment. It just all seemed like, there just didn't seem a connection there. Like it's like uh, he's he's so integrated in this this sort of household unit, and he's become sort of a player in the thing, and he's you know doing this education with these kids, and it's all going very well. And then he has this detour where he does decide to get this operation or this surgery, these implants, I guess. And it all seems like it comes out of the blue when he goes back and tells the guy at this house he's been living in. I just found it like. That kind of bugged me for some reason. And I'm not someone who normally focuses on plot points, but I mean, do I have that wrong? Like, did I just sort of miss something in that or did it not bother you guys as much as it bothered me? The one question I had about that scene, what what money was he asking to borrow from him? Uh, was it just the, you know, he said he was going to pay I, the 10% above the cost? Because he was if he was going to get that, presumably he had the sale money, the 26 right. right. And then he wanted to buy it back for twenty six thousand plus ten percent. So was he asking to borrow that twenty five hundred, or did he go out and spend some of that money? I didn't quite get that. I thought he had. I thought he had sold all that stuff and basically was left at that point pretty much with nothing. And I don't Where know did if that money go. Uh, to the to oh, the to, to, the, the, to the implants. That's right. You're right. To the, but the, but then I think it ties in with his girlfriend, who he didn't want to go back to her empty-handed or something. I, I thought it is. I mean, I'm sort of losing the chronology a little bit too. But I think I thought it was actually very interesting, and it was never really explained. And this is something I didn't. It didn't have to be explained because I found it kind of interesting when he did sort of reunite with his girlfriend. It never, he ne it never comes out that he sold all the stuff. And I think that was probably a pain point for him. And I thought that was handled well from a plot perspective. And I liked the, as a, as a story, I liked the, the idea that he, you know, spent this little bit of time and then just upped and left. Not because you, you know, it, it did avoid a little bit of the Hollywood trappings in that way. Cause I, this ties into my other point about the movie. I, what I liked about it and I'm, I didn't love it, love it, but I did like it quite a bit is I didn't think they sentimentalized uh, Ruben's character too much. I mean, he remained kind of very stubborn about, um, you know, where he was at with this and the fact that he went and paid. It was kind of like, it's neat. He's in a, in a very typical Hollywood movie, and maybe they don't even make movies this mawkish anymore, really. But in a more normal Hollywood movie, they would have had it where he ended up at this house and all would have turned out well, right? And he just like he would have taken the offer to, you know, run a program with the kids or something. And like fallen that. in love with that exactly, great, like fallen would in have, love with that great looking teacher. <laughs> yeah, and, and the conflict would have maybe been between that and his ex girlfriend or something like yeah. that. But Absolutely. the fact that he upped and left, it just like he couldn't get out of his head the fact that he wanted his life back, and I could really relate to that. Like I thought that was very well done. It's like, yeah, the fact that he's kind of because a few times I was thinking, man, you're just being an idiot. Like you know, like the the first doctor. And here's another plot point. I I don't know if you could get that kind of a surgery that's like with those implants without being told again and again and again that you're not getting your hearing back. Like I just thought that seemed a little. That struck me. Like he well. seemed very disappointed that yeah. he wasn't getting his normal thing back. And it's like, I don't think any, I don't think any health facility would, would do, would let you sort of harbor those illusions. Like <laughs> there'd be lots of legal protection and disclaimers yeah. and letting, making sure the person knew that it might not be a success. I agree with that. But I did love the scene when they first like turned it, like they first activated it. And I thought that was very well done. And to Stephen's point, I did like the way they, they used the sound and I didn't think they overused it. And I thought they brought it in effectively at certain points. Um, they didn't overplay it. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Stephen. I had a, but you go first. Well, one thing I'm, I'm, this is the only time I thought this, I realized lately that that acting means a big amount of what I how, what I appreciate. I always thought I was a plot guy, 
But in a movie like this, if there's a powerhouse performance, I'm sort of willing to give in to the plot holes and everything. I mean, it can't be too enormous. The movie can't suck, you know, I'll notice. But I was so taken with his performance. I've liked him before. And I think that uh, that made me, I don't know, congenial in, in that sense. It's like, I'm going to like this movie because I like this guy's acting. And I have a long lasting theory that we, we first we like or don't like something. And then we come up with a, uh, we write a paper on it. Oh, that's because it was this or that. But first we have to like it or not. And I think that he won me over. And they spent time after that trying to figure out why it was good movie. Because I yeah. No, he's very good. I When I looked up his uh, resume or filmography, and I must be missing something because he's very familiar to me. The only thing I, I probably scanned it too quickly. The thing I said, okay, well, that's why. It was that Kelly Reichardt film, um, the one about the nuclear plant, not nuclear plant, but it was, uh, it was an environment. Uh, it was environmentally tinged film. I can't even think of the name that way. I mentioned it last time, but I must have seen him in other stuff. Um, I was going to say one, Scott was talking about a scene I did like. I really liked the way that first, when he's with the girl, ex, with the girlfriend, he says, okay, you know, we got to get back in it with metal or the tour, the album, everything. And then that moment where he realized, you know, it's just not going to happen. The way he communicated that to her and the way they said how each of them had kind of saved each other's life. That was handled really well. And another thing I did like, and it was the one time I didn't like, and someone else might disagree, you guys might disagree, I didn't like the guy that ran the house at all. I understood what he was saying when he said, I'm gonna go for the operation. And I understood what he was saying when he said, you know, we live in this world where deafness is not, can't be, can't be thought of as a, as a handicap. And you would interfere with that. But I also kind of, not hate it, but disliked his character at the time because that's a, that's a movie thing where someone's life changes for the better. At that time, he thought his life was going to change it the better. And I got this feeling of deep resentment from him. Like, you know, okay, I, I can't be with you because you're going to be happy. And there's some ambiguity there. I, I, can, I can understand what he was saying and at the same time not like what he was saying. So sorry, I just had a little bit of interruption. You're talking about specifically about the scene where he basically lets him loose, saying, no, you can't. Where he like, comes back, he said, yeah. the first part of it, he says, I got to go back, where he tried to bore the money. And then he says, yeah. I just, oh, and yeah, he asked I, if he can stay on for three weeks. That was it. He says, no, you yeah, can't. No, I, I, I definitely don't think I agree with you on that, just because I think it's like, I get the feeling that's very realistic. Like in a community like that, there's yeah. like a there's oh, like a, there's like a, a certain bond that they have yeah. to co a code that they have to live by and I think it, it would have felt false I don't so may I'd sorry I might have like it's to me well, it just would have felt saying, false if it was yeah. if he had like accepted him in or something I don't know what well, I'm saying that's what makes it seem good because I think both things could be true oh, okay once. okay yes that's he has to he has to say you can't stay here but I can still not like him for saying it. You know, mm -hmm. I think okay. both things can be true. I think you're right. Realistically, you can't have this guy there. Hey, everybody. And, you know, two weeks, I'm going to be able to hear. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I thought that was handled well, that aspect. You know, that actor, Paul Racy, I did read a bit about him just before we started this. He actually said that was like, I think he said something like that was the proudest, like his proudest acting moment. Oh, I'm sure. Was. In his life. Oh, that particular said, scene? Yeah, yeah. And he said like, he said, you wouldn't believe like uh, how badly I wanted to like go out and run after the guy and say, no, come back after all. Like he said, it felt like such a pull. And he said the director was actually crying while they filmed it. So it was it a was very a, good, was scene, a good scene, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Um, one thing I had to say about the sound, you guys will get this. What do you think it reminded me of every time the sound, especially yeah. after they had the implants, the sound was distorted? The conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. All I could, I, I kept Amazing. waiting for, kept waiting <laughs> for someone to say he'd kill you if you had the chance. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny because I, I just watched that a few weeks ago. So, <laughs> yeah. I was reminded when he, when he first has them and he goes out and he and everything's jumbled. You can hear 
way more than he expects. I was reminded of an episode of Buffy. I don't remember anymore how it happened, but Buffy gets the, the power of she can hear everybody's thoughts and it seems cool for about three seconds. And then she, everywhere she goes, she hears everybody in the room. She knows what they're thinking all at the same time. And of course, we don't always think the nicest things either. And that came to me right away when he, when he went out and, and had that experience with his own hearing. Yeah, that's amazing. One thing I was thinking, if, if this film wins awards, Academy Awards, um, I don't know if it will. He might win Best Actor. I, I don't think it is, it's a favorite for Best Picture. Anyway, um, they'll all benefit. But I think the, the one entity that's going to benefit more than anything else from this film is the band Rudimentary Peni. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think, weren't they a spinoff from The Crass? Yeah. Oh, were they? <laughs> I think so. Well, I, so I, was, I wanted to expect him to go to the top of the iTunes chart now and everything because he had that T-shirt on eight times. Well, and of and of course I couldn't help think of you, Phil, when it, when he was wearing his Einsters and new box. I shirt. thought of Chuck. I was going to post yeah. on Chuck. Oh. <laughs> Get a Steven, still of that and say, expect Eisters on Newbot to make a huge comeback. Yeah, Stephen, Eisters and Newbot, just to fill you in a little bit on our little in humor here, not that it's a big deal, but, you know, <laughs> Phil and I came up as writers at the same time at Nerve Magazine in the late 80s when stuff like Einsters and Newbot were kind of the rage among the industry. And, you know, we, we, we certainly had our fun uh, laughing at the idea of bands <laughs> like Einsters and Newbot. And so, and then Chuck, was- Chuck Eddie ended up, you know, writing laudable things about them or whatever. And we had a guy there that just worshipped, Chris Toomey, that worshipped bands like that. Too bad he didn't wear a Skinny Puppy t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Skinny Puppy, weren't they a Canadian band? Though? Yeah, Vancouver. Yeah. They were our very, a... own Eisters, our, our yeah. very own Nurse with Wounds. <laughs> oh, I have is a friend who still loves Skinny Puppy, puppy which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, tr- I make it a point not to like any band that have a hard time saying their name. So, <laughs> skinny Puppy to that German band, right off. You know, the I one other you, thing, so go ahead, Phil. All I was gonna say is I assume you wrote about this on your site, Stephen, which I make a point not to read before we talk. You've done a yeah. entry, okay, I'm gonna go read that tonight. Then. You know, my usual four paragraphs. Yeah. Go ahead, Scott. So one, one thing I found, like I've been on Letterboxd and I actually went back to rating movies after I said I'm not gonna rate them because I decided to go back. I gave this one a 3.5, but this is a classic case for me of like, it's not a three, it's not a 3.5. It's really a 3.25 for me. It's a six and a half, like seven. I mean, so I'm, but I'm fine with a seven and three seemed a little too low, but I, I don't know. It's just, it's one of those silly things. I kind of wish it was out of 10. I, mean, I run it that 6. kind 5, of pitchfork system of, of like signing a 7.2. 7.2 or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, that, is that what, because I don't, outside of, I think of it tens. So when I go to letterbox. Uh, it's eight, then that makes it a four. Right, right. I, I mean, I, I know what you mean. Is it this or is it that? But I don't. I have a sense in my head. Everything starts as a six, and then if I like it, it becomes a seven. That's and interesting. If I like it, it becomes an eight. I mean, it's not very scientific. If I don't like it, it has to. I still have to not like it to get it down to a five, but. I think the only sort of, I think the only definitive criteria I've kind of come up with in my head is that if it's a four or over, I would happily like watch it again and possibly even soon. Like once it hits a four, 3.5 can be completely an enjoyable film, but one time, you know, especially as I feel as I'm getting older, I don't have that much time in life to see films over and over again. 3.5 means that was very good. I don't probably need to necessarily see it again. But if it's a like four, Chris Gow, if it's hey, a four, I'd want to see it. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a big difference, even though there's not that big a difference. And that I think he's even said it. B plus, he will never listen to it again. It goes on that shelf of the three billion other records he's got that he won't listen to. A minus, yeah, he'll probably listen to it again. And that's yep. kind of what you're saying there. It's like, yeah, I think I might watch that again. I have so the same go problem. Go I've, I've rated now. I got through all the films that I've seen for the last 10 years, the ones I'm going to rate, and that's 1,200 films. Wow. And my my 3.5 is like 45% of my ratings. Mm. But that 6 to 7 is where I constantly 
have to decide, does this get a yeah. 3.5 or does it get a 3? Yeah. And this particular film is exactly in that range. The only difference, Scott, is you break 3.5. When I go on and rate it, I'll probably, I don't know, I'll, do, I'll either give it a 3.5 because I can see it set out to do everything it wanted. It had a great ending, nice performance, or I'll be a little more honest and the experience of watching it was more like a three for me. But that's the range where I have have to yeah. constantly decide, is this a three or is it a 3.5? I know it's weird, eh? I really do, it, whether it's a three or three and a half, whatever. when the movie's over, and my wife, she doesn't rate movies, and she thinks everything I give is a six or a seven, it's pretty much true. But I'll say to myself, I don't know if it's a seven or an eight in this particular case, or I don't know if it's a six or a seven. It's, it's not, never obvious, you know, okay. Mad Max Fury Road, that was a 10, but, you know, I, I really decide, you know, and so then I write about it, and I, I look at it, and I say, oh, this looks like a 7, or this looks like an 8, or whatever, you know, you want to somehow match what you've just written to some arbitrary uh, rating system. No, I'll often post a, like a title in my diary, like I watched this movie today, and I'll leave the rating for a day, like it's almost like I need to think about it a little bit, and it's that whole thing. A few writers have said this, but isn't there a famous quote from some writer saying someone asked him, what, the, you know, what did you think of the movie? It might've been Saris actually. He said, what did you think of the movie? He said, I'll let you know when I've written my review, which is sort of true, right? Like you kind of, you, you, when you think it through, that kind of can make a bit of a difference. So one other thing I wanted to say about the movie that I found just remarkable, and I've been meaning to go back online just to sort of look at like sort of before and after stills from the movie is, I could not believe how the his, I keep the guy referring to as the girlfriend. She's got a name, but how much she had changed in her look. Like I did oh, not. I don't think I would have recognized her. Like when she was living with her, you know, wealthy dad or whatever, compared yeah. to what she looked like when she was in the band. Like what a transformation! I knew the actor that played her dad, and I, I again I went to his filmography. I think I know him from Munich, the Spielberg film. You know who I he thought, reminded me of? Polanski. A, Polanski a little bit. And he also looked like somebody who was on Twin Peaks. Mm. But um, I thought I knew him from a French film, but I don't think so. I think it's Munich. Can't think of the guy's name. Okay. I think definitely, probably in the Academy Awards, the other guy would win supporting actor. I mean, not, not that I care about the Academy Awards and not that I've kept up these last two years, which have been so strange, but I think he'll probably win, I would guess. I don't can't remember off the top of my head. I I just assume that uh, the other male of uh, the best actors they don't have a chance because Chadwick Boseman is going to win. I don't I don't think Riz Ahmed thinks he's going to win. Not the way that they they say. Oh, I was surprised that no, he knows that he's not going to win, and he doesn't. He knows that he can't take a person. Um, and I think the other nominees in that particular category also also know that. I don't, I don't remember, um, how did they do the Judas and the Black Messiah? Those two guys, I think they're both nominated for Best Actor instead of one of each. Oh, there was controversy. The guy that got the supporting nomination in uh, terms of screen time ha had more screen time than the guy that got oh. the Best Actor nomination. I, their difference was marginal, but they shouldn't even be close, right? <laughs> yeah, wow. Well. I do have to see that film as soon as it's yeah, I really want to cheap see that way too. to see it. I will. So we got less than a minute. So okay, um, so that was. A good I think that's good. Yeah, we'll we'll. Uh, I, I'll end this now, and we'll go into the next okay. one. Okay, I'll call, call you back. Okay. Okay. Okay.